Hey, I'm golf broadcaster Matt Adams, the updated and expanded second edition of my book, The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments, is now available. Readers can expect to march with Arnie's Army at the 1960 U.S. Open, relive Jack Nicklaus's remarkable 1986 Masters win, and be amazed by the Tiger Slam. The Golf Round I'll Never Forget, Golf's Biggest Stars Recall Their Finest Moments. Pick it up where fine books are sold, including barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. This day in sports history. Hey, and welcome to another edition of This Day in Sports History. It's April 20th, and on this day in 1986, Michael Jordan scored 63 in a playoff game against the Boston Celtics. First off, it should be said this was not a very good Chicago Bulls team. The dynasty was still a few years off. The Bulls finished the regular season 30-52 and and were the eighth seed in the NBA playoffs against the top seed from the East, Boston. Jordan was a second-year pro who missed 64 games in the regular season due to a broken foot, a story he talked about in the Last Dance documentary. The Celtics, as the higher seed, had home court advantage, which was indeed a huge advantage for them. They were nearly unbeatable at home that season, going 40-1 in the Garden. The Celtics had won Game 1 by 19, despite Jordan scoring 49. Prior to Game 2, Jordan was interviewed by CBS's Pat O'Brien, and he said he did not think that one man could beat the Boston Celtics. It needed to be a five-man effort. Well, that went out the window pretty quickly. Jordan unleashed his frustration at having missed the majority of the season at the lack of quality around him, and he put the team on his back for a crazy ride. His teammates were in awe of what happened that day, with John Paxson saying, I found myself just wanting to stop and watch him, and I was playing. Larry Bird was amazed as well at what Jordan did, saying, I think it's just God disguised as Michael Jordan. Michael hit 22 of 41 shots and 19 of his 21 free throws. He had 54 at the end of regulation when he hit a pair of free throws with no time on the clock to send it to overtime. Interesting thing with that, though, is that Jordan was fouled taking a three. That would have won it. At the time, the rules only gave a pair of free throws if fouled on a three-point attempt. Now, a shooter would be given three free throws. The Bulls had the lead late in the first OT, until Boston's Danny Ainge tied it again with a layup. In the second overtime, Jordan hit his final bucket with 112 remaining, tying the game once again. But not only would that be Jordan's last points, it was also the Bulls' last points. Jerry Schiesting hit a jumper on the other end to give Boston the lead back, and the Celtics held on for the 125-121 double overtime win. Jordan's magical 63 topped the previous playoff game record of 61, set by Elgin Baylor in 1962, and it's still the NBA single-game playoff record. Also on this day, in 1981, it was a record-setting performance for Japan's Toshihiko Siko and New Zealand's Allison Rowe at the Boston Marathon. Taking advantage of favorable weather conditions, Seiko made a move on Heartbreak Hill to gain a little advantage, and then he picked up the pace in the final 5K to win in a record time of 2 hours, 9 minutes, 26 seconds, one second better than Bill Rogers' effort two years before. Rowe obliterated the Boston women's record by nearly 8 minutes, running the 26.2-mile course in 2 hours, 26 minutes, 46 seconds. Of course, those records have been bested. Seiko's record was topped the following year by American Alberto Salazar. Rose Mark lasted two years before American Joan Benoit chopped another four minutes off her time. So, from the Celtics to the Marathon to the Red Sox, let's keep the Boston theme going. Also on this day in 1912, the first baseball game was played at Fenway Park. The Red Sox beat the New York Highlanders, which would become the Yankees the following season, by the score of 7-6. And in 1967, boxing promoter Don King killed a man in a bar. And interestingly enough, it wasn't the first person that King had actually killed. On this day, King was in Cleveland, 
he walked into a local Cedar Street drinking establishment and he saw Sam Garrett. According to King, Garrett owed him $600 for an unpaid gambling debt. And what happened in the few minutes after King walked in differed in who you talked to. King's story was that Garrett attacked him from behind. Eyewitnesses to the event told a different story to the police, however, saying Garrett was a small guy who was not looking for trouble and King attacked him because he saw him as easy prey. After that, everybody agreed what took place. King pushed Garrett to the floor of the bar and started raining down blows on him. He beat him without mercy until he lay unconscious and bleeding. Garrett died five days later in a Cleveland hospital. In the trial, King was convicted by a jury of second-degree murder, which could and should have led to life in prison. But here's the kicker. The judge made another judgment, overruling the jury and reduced it to involuntary manslaughter. Pretty shady in itself, but even more shady when you learn that the decision was made after a private meeting between King's attorney and the judge without the prosecutor or court reporter present. King was sentenced and served just over three years in jail. And now, here's another kicker. In 2016, the street where this bar was located was renamed Don King Way. In today's non-sports, did you know? An ostrich can run nearly 45 miles per hour at top speed. That's all for today. Thanks for stopping by and giving today's show a listen. I'll have more tomorrow on This Day in Sports History. This has been an original Thrive Suite production. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.